Apparent life-threatening events is our next protocol, and the only change for this one is we've bolded the contact and medical control if the parent or the uh, guardian refuses transport of the patient. And this is, you'll find the first protocol that has a little telephone, and the telephone is an icon for places where we advise that you talk to med control over situations. You know, the reason that we w would like to be involved in this, we admit all these kids to the hospital. It's not necessarily, in the vast majority <coughs> of the time, it's true, nothing happens. But if there's some way to uh, prevent a death here, we want every opportunity to be able to do that. Um, we admit them typically overnight for observation for apnea, arrhythmia, um, hypoxia. And you can really only do that in a monitored setting. So while some parents might uh, sort of underreact potentially to this situation or, um, you know, just not want to go to the hospital, if you can't convince them, uh, please get medical control involved and, and we'll try to do that as well. Next, we have asthma. the asthma. <coughs> so uh, changes for this protocol. Uh, one of the um, big changes uh, that we made is we're uh, allowing additional doses of um, aduanib and, uh, or I should say, ipitropium along with albuterol as an option. And this is basically uh, to reflect the um, heart, um, blood, and lung uh, guidelines, uh, just kind of uh, their recommendations on um, additional dose of ipitropine as being uh, possibly um, helpful uh, for these patients. Uh, we've also moved, uh, CPAP uh, is uh, now moved up to the advanced DMT level. Um, there will be a separate uh, CPAP procedure that we'll talk about in the protocols as well. Um, but basically, uh, when CPAP before was just for congest suspected congestive heart failure, uh, now you can use it for um, anybody with uh, severe respiratory distress or impending respiratory failure at the um, advanced DMT level. And I know that Solumedrol, the new dosing in the last edition of the protocols, has created a significant controversy. I, I would <coughs> like to take the opportunity to clarify and hopefully justify for everybody why we chose 62.5 milligrams. First of all, there's no magic dose of Solumedrol or, or any steroid for that example. There's a very, very wide therapeutic range. Uh, why did we ultimately settle on 125 in the past? I don't know. The best I can tell is it's because there was 125 milligrams in that vial. So we said give them a whole vial. Um, there's no proof that that's the right dose. Lots of studies show a very, very wide range. You can use much lower doses, still be effective in terms of the anti-inflammatory effects that we're getting from it, and not get all the side effects associated with it. Uh, the side effects are much more prominent in folks that are diabetic. The uh, extra steroids will drive their blood sugar up, and that's very, very prominent in children as well. So part of the reason for choosing 62.5 was in the setting of a large child who just is bigger than the Braslow tape, but still is a child and may not be very heavy, it really would prevent us from overdosing that child. Uh, on the Siamedrol. It's still a good dose, perfectly fine dose for adults. It's reasonable. I only give 60 milligrams in, in the ER typically. And to be honest, there's no immediate effects that we should be expecting from Siamedrol anyway. You know, earliest effects may be 8 to 10 hours after administration. So don't feel like you're not being able to uh, do the appropriate thing for your patient by giving this lower dose. So, behavioral emergencies. Big thing that has come up recently has been agitated delirium. Uh, we are seeing more and more, more patients with it, um, especially in the more sort of <coughs> metropolitan areas. Um, and what we're finding with these folks is that they require huge amounts of sedation to get them under control so that it ultimately might be safe to transport them. Uh, sometimes they are just uh, agitated and create an unseen, unsafe situation for themselves and for providers. 
So we have beefed up the medication section for uh, behavioral emergencies to reflect the potential sedative requirements for patients with agitated delirium. And I guess I, what I would add to that is uh, there is um, a definition that we added under our uh, caution box in this protocol. And it's just really important for our EMS providers as well as um, our uh, law enforcement providers in the state as well um, that these patients are at risk for sudden death. If you suspect they have excited agitated delirium, the reason you need to get um, control of them with uh, you know, benzodiazepines and, um, and or Haldol uh, is because um, they're at a sudden risk for cardiac, um, cardiac arrest. And typically, if they do suffer a cardiac arrest, um, they're pretty hard to resuscitate. Um, the other thing we did add in this protocol as well, um, or I should say we um, separated out, is restraints is now in its own procedure. Um, and we have a, a protocol for um, our policy for police custody um, as well, um, dealing with those situations, which is kind of linked um, off of this protocol. Okay. Good. So specifically, the doses for uh, midazolam is five milligrams every 10 minutes as needed. And that would be m the first line. If that doesn't work, you can add Haldol, 10 milligrams IM, every 10 minutes. And in the situation where you need more than 10 milligrams of midazolam or 20 milligrams of Hel Peridol, I think it would be reasonable to call medical control um, and we might consider some other options at that point. But first and foremost, please make sure that you're safe when dealing with these patients. They're very unpredictable and uh, they seem to have episodes where they're calm for one second, so don't let your guard down because the next thing you know they are agitated and off the wall again. So please be very, very cautious. Okay, next protocol is the diabetic. And the only change that we have here is on our dosing of the D50. In the old protocols, we uh, said to give an amp at 25 grams, and now we're saying to give up to 25 grams. So if you only need half, a, half an amp, uh, you can go ahead and do that. And I, think I take it back. That's not the only other thing. <coughs> One other thing is we have, in the pediatrics, moved the glucagon dosages up to the AEMT levels. So they'll see those, find those there. And again, and we haven't really talked about it, at the EMT intermediate versus the AEMT, in, in these sets of protocols with the IOs and the pediatric medications, those can only be performed by the AEMTs or those that have transitioned over uh, from the EMTI. Let's make sure that's clear. You'll find more information about that in the preface of the document. <coughs> Fever protocol, I think this is kind of exciting when the protocol committee and Jim can speak to it as well. We were talking about the um, acetaminophen and ibuprofen and it was at the paramedic level and we all know at home we all t can take ibuprofen or acetaminophen and so we did move it up from the paramedic level to the EMT level for fevers. Um, the dosages are there. Under the um, pediatrics, you'll find that we're going to reference our uh, pediatric appendices in the back of the book. And you will find back there that you know, you'll, you'll line the child up with the Braslow tape, match the color, and you'll find your dosages there for them. And I think there was some extended care, but it's repeat dosages, yep. it's just <coughs> your 24 hour limits on how much you want to give. Yep. All right. Hypothermia. There, the only changes here, we added midazolam, we didn't have all three of the benzos in the adult protocol. And then we didn't have any in the pediatrics. And as we know, we always want to try and keep the adult and pediatrics as much the same as we can. And so we've added them in, into there as well. Mm -hmm. And the idea, again, behind using uh, benzodiazepines in hypothermia is hopefully to prevent shivering. Um, 
shivering just uses up more of your resources, um, and we're trying to save those. And for hypothermia, um, I don't think we really had too many changes in this. Uh, the only kind of pearl we added on the bottom, uh, we've uh, been in contact with the um, medical director of the Mass General Burn uh, Center, and um, they've actually been using um, IVTPA uh, for uh, severe frostbite injuries. Uh, not that a patient would have to get transported directly there um, to the burn center from the field for severe, severe frostbite, but it's just something that uh, we added in that uh, patients with severe frostbite injury uh, may benefit from urgent um, treatment with IVTPA. Um, a lot of our emergency departments around the state also are not aware of this, so it's just something to be aware that they may be able to go through the um, system and end up at the burn center for uh, treatment. Under the nausea and vomiting protocol, um, most things continue, they're the same. We have multiple different antiemetics, <coughs> knowing that we've had significant medication shortages in the past. Um, it's likely that this will continue in the future. So that's why there's so many different options of antiemetics, so that hopefully, depending on whatever shortage we're dealing with at the time, we'll be able to find one that we can use and have available. The other thing that's different in the nausea and vomiting protocol is uh, um, use of diphenhydramine in the extended care setting for someone potentially with motion sickness, as well as also in the, in the extended care protocols is, again, repeat dosing that you'll find common throughout the document. Next is the nerve agents. Uh, in the previous versions of the protocols, you found these in the back of the book <coughs> under the MCI, but we recognize that you don't need an MCI to have a potential organophosphate poisoning, so we moved them up into the regular medical protocols. Uh, there has, otherwise there's no change. We just moved them from one area of the document to the other. And we took out the, there were three before there was the adult, there was a provider in the pediatric, and the adult and the provider were the same, and so we just uh, consolidated them. Special thanks to Janet Houston for developing the charts that you see that aid us in the, uh, you know, how to dose the duodote kits. All right, next section is newborn care. Really the only significant changes there are modifications that we made to be consistent with the most recent set of uh, NHTSA guidelines regarding the safe transport of children. Uh, two things, whenever possible, the neonate should be transported in a appropriately sized child safety seat and, which no doubt will cause some controversy, uh, they also recommend, if possible, uh, a big if possible and bold, black letters to separate the baby and the mother and transport them in separate rigs. Reason being, it's I think pretty much impossible to care for two patients by yourself, uh, one of whom needs active rewarming and the mother might need some resuscitation by herself in the back of the ambulance. Uh, realistically, I, I think they will be better served uh, each being cared for individually. Um, I know that's going to create a little bit of controversy, but that is, in fact, the recommendation from NHTSA uh, just as of this summer, in fact. 